The news now, Clive Myrie in the studio and Michel Hussain in Paris. Nearly four million people take to the streets of France in a series of defiant rallies against extremism. In Paris, more than a million and a half gather in the wake of the terrorist attack, saying that they stand for democracy and freedom of speech. The message is more global. I think it's not uh, just uh, Charlie Hebdo, it's uh, the, all the liberty which is attacked. It is exactly to show we are we are this uh, country of uh, liberty, of uh, fraternity, of we want a better humankind. In an unprecedented gathering, world leaders joined the march led by families of the 17 people killed in three days of violence. A video emerges showing one of the Paris gunmen saying he acted on behalf of Islamic State. From Paris tonight, we'll be reflecting on a day unique in France's post-war history. Also on tonight's programme, an independent task force is to be set up to improve cancer care in England. And Labour wants energy companies to be forced to cut gas and electricity bills if wholesale prices fall. Good evening from Paris. Not since the liberation of this city from the Nazis in 1944 have there been scenes like those today. A million and a half people out on the streets here in a defiant march against extremism in the wake of the terrorist attacks that killed 17 people. The huge turnout here in Paris was replicated across France with a total of nearly 4 million people taking part in the marches. Nearly 40 leaders from around the world joined President Hollande in Paris. He said that today, Paris was the capital of the world. Our first report is from our correspondent, Lucy Williamson, who spent the day with those taking part in the Unity March. They call it freedom, and today they came to flaunt it. A million people of different faiths, flags, languages, united in one message. So it is exactly to show we are, we are this country of liberty, of fraternity, of we want a better humankind, so we have to be there. We don't necessarily have to be uh, in respect with the political idea of Charlie Hebdo, but the message is more global. I think it's not uh, just uh, Charlie Hebdo, it's uh, the, all the liberty which is attacked. There are people here from every section of French society. Some have come out onto the street like this for the first time. These attacks were meant to silence and intimidate the residents of France. This is their answer. For others, the rally marked a more private grief. The family of policeman Ahmed Merabet, who was killed outside the offices of Charlie Hebdo, held their own memorial today at the local town hall. All around his mother, the slogans read, We are Ahmed, all of them symbolically her children now. For the rallies in Paris, across France and across the world, I thank you. It means a lot to us. For once, the guests of honour weren't the presidents, but the families of those who died. The French president greeted them individually, along with Charlie Hebdo's surviving staff, fresh from working on next week's magazine. Marching behind them, leaders from more than 40 nations, linking arms in solidarity with France. We're saying this is an appalling terrorist attack. It's an attack on the values that we hold dear to in Britain, about freedom of speech, about democracy, about tolerance, and we want to stand with you to make that point. For most here, marching wasn't that easy. Too many people had decided to come. The interior minister said the numbers were uncountable. The message to France's attackers was stark, that however slow their journey, 
or painful the killings. Those who are left will carry on. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. Well, just as the marches were taking place across France, there was a reminder of those responsible for the violence that sparked so much anger. A video was posted online showing one of the Paris gunmen, Amadi Koulibaly, declaring allegiance to Islamic State. He killed a policewoman and four hostages before being killed when police ended the siege at the kosher supermarket on Friday. Damien Grammaticus reports now on the gunman's video. <laughs> Amadi Koulibaly. He's been dead two days, but he returned to haunt France today. A video posted on the internet. Prepare, the Quranic verse urges, strengthen yourself to frighten the enemies of Allah. The man who terrorized this nation taunts France, mocks it, even as it rallied. You decide what's happening in the world, don't you? Well, no, we're not going to allow that. We're going to fight, inshallah, to spread Allah's word. Police shot Koulibaly dead in a Paris supermarket on Friday. He says his actions were revenge for France, bombing and killing fighters and civilians in Syria's so-called Islamic State. And his attacks were coordinated with the rampage by the Kouachi brothers, though they pledged allegiance to a rival terror group, Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Our team was divided into two. They went out against Charlie Hebdo, I went out against the police. We did some things together and some separately so we could have a bigger impact. It is almost inconceivable that ISIS would sponsor one action uh, and at the same time uh, Al-Qaeda in the Yemen will sponsor another because these two organizations are almost at war. They are killing each other in Syria. A nondescript Paris flat is where Koulibaly lived, along with his wife. They were seen here just a few days ago. Their neighbours, like the rest of France, told us they're shocked. They were normal people, very discreet, very polite, always saying hello and thank you, always had a smile, never a word about politics or religion. So even Koulibaly's neighbours didn't think he posed a threat points to the dilemma facing Western governments. How are they meant to identify the most violent extremists? The leaders gathered here today pledged to do more to stop people travelling to Syria, but they can't guarantee there won't be future attacks. Koulibaly's wife, Hayat Boumedien, is now believed to have fled just before his attacks to Syria. Despite today's show of unity, France remains in the sights of radical extremists. Damien Grammaticus, BBC News, Paris. Today's marches were a truly national event in France, taking place far beyond Paris. In Marseille, which is home to France's largest Muslim population, tens of thousands took part. But a prominent Jewish leader in that city has said that many Jews are now deeply anxious and thinking about leaving France. Our special correspondent, Fergal Keane, reports now on the reflections across France in the wake of the attacks. Commemorated in stone, it is the French city with the strongest links to the Arab world. And today, tens of thousands of its citizens came out to march against extremist violence. These are days when, even if only briefly, the pen seems mightier than the sword. And the plea for tolerance is deeply felt. Today, I feel like uh, talking to each other, trying to understand uh, him or her is more important than ever. Why did you come today? Mm -hmm. uh, because we are uh, Charlie, we are to only Charlie. You're all together? Oh, yes, we are together, of Sorry. course. <laughs> there is an impressive array of voices in this city arguing for tolerance and for coexistence. But it would be naive to imagine that the deep divisions in this society, a complex mix of culture, politics and religion, will be swept away by the spirit of the moment. In the Jewish community, which suffered persecution here under the Nazis and more recent anti-Semitic attacks, the violence in Paris has unleashed fresh trauma. Jews are very anxious, as they've never been before. They all talk about living. That's all you hear in the families. When will you live? How will you live? What job will you do? 
uh, most of the Jews think of leaving now because they don't feel secure at all in France. Uh, I have to feel strong to show that I'm strong, but in fact, I'm very scared. In this city with the largest Muslim population in France, there is widespread revulsion at the violence. But there is also a range of responses to the demonstrations. This woman who wanted to protect her identity condemned the violence, but also the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. I want to say very firmly, I am against this terrorist attack. But I have also the right to have my free speech and say that I am not Charlie. I am a Muslim citizen of France. This is a city with a vibrant racial and religious mix, where Muslims are part of the political mainstream. The Muslim mayor of the city's toughest quarter says tolerance will be the way forward. Marseille is a cosmopolitan city. People are deeply touched because here nationalities are mixed. That is the story of this port. We face the Mediterranean and people know the richness of our mix here. From the city that is France's gateway to the Arab world, there's both a hopeful plea for coexistence, but shadowed by a deep sense of unease about the future. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Marseille. Let's hear more now from Lucy Williamson, our Paris correspondent, who's in Place de la République from uh, where the Paris marchers set off. Uh, Lucy, what did you make of today? How representative was this crowd of French society? Well, it's hard to imagine, looking at the Place now, that just a few hours ago you couldn't squeeze your way in here. The Place itself and all the roads around it were completely blocked. The government was saying the numbers were uncountable. Well, they did try to count them in the end, and they think perhaps a million and a half people may have converged on Paris today, two and a half million in other towns and cities. And I think just being here this afternoon, what was really striking to me was the diversity of the crowd. There were lots of families, lots of elderly people. We saw a young boy on crutches who had made his way here. And the mood, very warm, very positive. People really wanting to come out and make it clear how strongly they felt about the values that had come under attack. I think the world will have been watching this march today. And I think France also surprised itself with how strongly it felt. Lucy, thank you. It has been a day of powerful symbolism and powerful sentiment, and I'll have more on that before the end of the programme. For now, though, Clive, back to you. Michelle, many thanks. Let's look at some of the day's other top stories now. And the NHS in England has announced it's creating an independent task force to improve cancer care. It will focus on trying to diagnose the disease more quickly and follows concerns that despite recent improvements, UK survival rates still lag behind Europe for many common cancers. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. Survival rates have improved dramatically in recent decades, but there is a sense of the UK needing to up its game for early diagnosis of cancer and give patients better chances of pulling through. That's the challenge for the new task force of experts set up by NHS England. What we're aiming to do is to get to a definitive yes or no, this is or isn't cancer, much, much faster than we're able to do today. And we're exploring that through about 60 projects that we'll be taking forward over the next 12 months. The pilot projects which will be run by the task force include letting patients refer themselves for diagnosis rather than going through their GPs, allowing patients to have different tests in the same place and on the same day, and letting GPs send patients direct for specific tests without having to go through a specialist. But all of this will come too late to help Erica, whose daughter Gemma died of cervical cancer. When she went to accident and emergency, doctors didn't pick up the symptoms, even though she thought they were serious. I would hope that no one would have to go through what Gemma went through when she went to A&E. So I would like there to be perhaps a place where you can be taken seriously. And even if you are one of these people that's a time waster, they can weed those people out and get to the people that really need it. The opening of this new high-tech building this year will hold an important step forward for cancer research. The Francis Crick Institute, which will cover work on cancer and other diseases, is being billed as a world-class research facility and one of the largest of its kind in Europe. 
But with more treatments coming on stream, resources are stretched. The Cancer Drugs Fund for medicines not normally available on the NHS is about to cut the number of drugs which can be financed. An announcement, likely to be controversial, is due this week. Hugh Pym, BBC News. More than 50 people have died after a bus collided with an oil tanker in Pakistan near the city of Karachi. Both vehicles burst into flames. The tanker was reportedly speeding and travelling on the wrong side of the road when it hit the bus head-on and the tanker driver is said to have fled the scene. Officials say they can only identify the dead using DNA records. Search teams looking for the wreckage of an Air Asia plane which crashed into the Java Sea a fortnight ago say they've detected electronic signals that may be coming from one of its flight recorders. Divers will try to retrieve it tomorrow. The aircraft came down in bad weather, killing all 162 people on board. Power supplies have been restored to most of the homes affected in the north of Scotland by the recent heavy storms. Scottish Hydro says more than 100,000 customers now have their electricity back since gale force winds hit power lines on Friday. But around 10,000 are still without power. Ed Miliband has called for the energy regulator to be given new powers to force companies to pass on reductions in the wholesale price of oil and gas. The Labour leader told the BBC he would demand fast-track legislation on energy in a Commons debate next week. The companies insist they're passing on price cuts to consumers. Here's Ben Wright. Tanking oil prices are being felt at the pumps, but home energy bills have not fallen. And this week, Labour will hold a Commons vote on their plan to force energy firms to cut prices. It will give the regulator the power to cut prices to bring immediate relief. Now, it's time for the government to put their money where their mouth is. We've got a zombie parliament, which isn't actually doing anything, isn't actually passing much legislation. Let's, in the last three months of this parliament, do something that will actually make a difference. Last week, the Chancellor said falls in wholesale prices must be passed on to consumers. But ministers argue Labour's existing plan for a two-year price freeze is keeping energy bills high now. One industry analyst said giving Ofgem the power to force price cuts could backfire. What you could see is that this damages trust in the market, that it damages consumer trust in the market, and it actually reduces switching rates and competition in the market. But Labour are keeping their political focus on prices, the cost of living and wages. The key, they say, to bringing down the deficit. And that will be the subject of another politically symbolic electioneering vote in the Commons this week. A Conservative plan to commit the next Parliament to £30 billion of savings. Ed Miliband said it's a gimmick, but his party will support it anyway. What the British public now want to know is if he's now supporting this further £30 billion of necessary consolidation, is how is he going to pay for it? Because he has no plans to bring about further savings in government departments. He has plans for more borrowing, more spending and more debt. And he's got plans for more taxes. And if that's what he's planning to do, then the British people deserve to know about it. Labour doesn't accept the £30 billion figure, and big differences are emerging between the party's plans for dealing with the deficit. Tomorrow, David Cameron will say making Britain live within its means will be the first theme of the Conservative Party's manifesto. Ben Wright, BBC News, Westminster. The Swedish actress Anita Ekberg has died at the age of 83. She was best known for her role in Federico Fellini's 1960 film, La Dolce Vita. Marcello! That scene in Rome's Trevi Fountain is one of cinema's most iconic moments. She died in Rome this morning following a series of illnesses. Let's return now to our main story tonight, the Unity March in Paris, where one million people and 40 world leaders showed solidarity with the victims of the Charlie Hebdo massacre. Michelle Hussein is in Paris for us. Michelle. Clive, thank you. Today's marches have been unprecedented in France's post-war history. Unprecedented numbers of people coming out onto the streets. With me is our Europe editor, Gavin Hewitt, um, to bring the programme to a close. And it's hard not to have been moved, Gavin, seeing the, the sentiment, the emotion out on the streets. But what, if anything, does it lead to? Well, I mean, I agree with you. The numbers were huge. It was a really impressive day for France. And obviously, what the government hopes is that such crowds will weaken support for the extremists. But they have no illusions. They actually expect further 
terrorist attacks. But that's not to say that this amazing show of unity uh, is without value. I mean, the French Prime Minister this week has been saying, uh, we are Charlie now, we are all police officers now, we're all Jews in France now. And tonight he came out and said he hoped that the spirit of January 11th today would continue and that as a result of that, France would be a different place. But of course, we'll have to see about that. Yeah, I mean, that is a very big aspiration to have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no disguising. There are divisions uh, in this country. Uh, there is a stagnating economy. There is a weak president. There's high unemployment. There are a lot of people who feel socially excluded living on the edge of cities. There is a, a very strongly performing far right group. Uh, the Front National in this country. So, of course, there are huge problems. But what the government hopes that today mobilized uh, moderate French opinion, and they hope that that will have some impact over what are bound to be some difficult and tense months ahead. Gavin, thank you very much. Our Europe editor, Gavin Hewitt, there, um, bringing our coverage from Paris today to a close. In a moment, we'll have the news where you are but it has been a remarkable day here a remarkable day because of the unprecedented numbers the sheer mass of humanity and the people who turned out on the streets but also in the individual messages that people held aloft the now familiar je suis charlie but also many messages of tolerance peace and freedom espousing the values of the french republic we're going to leave you now with some of the images of this remarkable day from paris from France and from beyond France, including some images from London. From our team here in Paris, good night.